Hi, welcome to this creative class for smart English students. Why are you smart? You're smart for a very good reason. You've tuned in to a class that will help you communicate worldwide on all levels. There was a study done of people that have graduate, graduated high school all over the world. And this study showed from these students and people that had graduated that the most important subject that they took throughout their school was communication. And as we know, English is the worldwide language. In fact, almost all people in the world know a couple of words of English. They know hi, which is the greeting that they give you, which is a very nice greeting. It means to be high and happy when you say hello to the person and goodbye. And what does goodbye mean? It means be good. You're a good person. Bye until I see you again. Be blessed. So uh, life is a game. My teacher had told me that. And we have to learn certain rules to play a game and have fun. So we're going to learn some beautiful rules today in this first lesson. The objectives of this first lesson, which is a big lesson, are four. At the end of this first lesson, you will know how and understand how to read and understand an autobiography. What is a biography? A biography is a story of somebody's life. And most biographies are written by people that look at the life and examine it and then write a story about a famous person. Uh, for instance, like Mahatma Gandhi, many books are written about Mahatma Gandhi. But an autobiography, A-U-T-O, in front of the word biography, means that the autobiography is written by the person himself. So in this story, uh, this first lesson we have, the story is written by himself. And it's written by a famous cricket player who played games for his whole life. Also, later on in the lesson, you will be able to use compound words. Compound words are words that are made up of two words. It gives you a much greater uh, definition of what you're trying to convey. You will be able to use simple past tense. I've gone to the store. I've went to the store. And uh, be able to tell what you've done to other people. And answer simple questions. So we'll start the lesson. The first question we have is, all babies look alike. Can they be exchanged when the nurse gives them a bath? Back in 1949, uh, in the hospitals in India, uh, they would have many people uh, that were born, and they'd all be in the same, same room. And as you can see from these two pictures, which are taken days apart, different babies, they look alike. So when the nurses would come in and wash all the babies, at that time, in 1949, sometimes they would put the baby in the wrong basket. And that's what happened in the story of the person who we're studying today. It's uh, written by a famous cricketer by the name of Sunil Gassavar. He, um, he was a famous cricketer, helped uh, India to win many, uh, many matches and was traveled worldwide. And what is he doing now? He's still traveling worldwide and he's helping people all over the world. I'll tell you more about that later. I'm going to read this to you and you can follow along with me. I may never have become a cricketer and this book, which these paragraphs come from, would certainly have not been written. If an eagle-eyed relation, Mr. Narayan Masarikar, had not come into my life on the day I was born. And the day he was born was July 10th, 1949. It seems that Nanakaka, that's what uh, Sunil would call his uh, grandfather, as I call him, who had come to see me in the hospital on the first day, my first day in the world, he noticed uh, a hole on the top of his left earlobe. You know what the earlobe is, that's the bottom part of the ear. But there was a small hole in Sunil's earlobe, and he, he noticed that. So the next day he came too, and uh, he picked up the baby lying next to his mother, 
Sunil's mother. And he looked at the baby. The babies are so cute and so nice to hold when they're young. To his utter horror, he looked and he discovered that the baby did not have a hole on his left earlobe. Now, one day it can have a hole, but the next day it should have a hole too. It doesn't heal up overnight like that. So he said, this is not your baby. This is not the baby that was born to you. So they had a frantic search. All the cribs in the hospital followed. And I, meaning Sunil, was found sleeping blissfully. Blissfully sleeping next to a fisherwoman, another lady who had a baby at the same time. And he didn't know. He's only one day old, okay? So any place is a nice place to sleep. But he's sleeping on his left ear, and you can't see the hole here. But he's very happy the way he is. And he, when he was sleeping there, uh, the fisherman did not, didn't know the commotion that was being caused by the switch of the baby. The mix-up, it appears, followed after the babies had been given their bath. Providence, Providence had helped me to retain my true identity. And in the process, charter the course of my life. I have often wondered what would have happened if nature had not marked me out. You can see, marked me out in the parentheses with the mark on his ear. And given me my guard, the guard, okay, was his uncle, all right? And given me that small hole in my left earlobe. And if Nana... Nan Karka had not noticed this abnormality, perhaps I would have been grown up into an obscure fisherman toiling somewhere on the West Coast. That's where most of the fishermen go to the West Coast of India. And what about the baby for a spell who took my place? I do not know if he is interested in cricket or whether he would ever read this book. I can only hope that if he does, he will take an interest in Sunil Gaskavar. Gavaskar. And you can see a picture of him. Now he's grown up here. And he's traveling around the world. He's uh, done a lot of beautiful uh, playing as a cricket player. And then he was an announcer. And now he travels around the world, helping many young children of all nations. So based on these first three paragraphs, we have some text questions. We'll see how you've been paying attention. The first question is, when was Sunil Gavaskar born? Okay, you remember what the date was? It was July 10th, 1949. Two, what did Sunil's uncle, Mr. Narayan Masarikar, notice when he came to see the baby in the hospital? Do you know the answer? Of course you do. There was a little hole in his left earlobe. Three, what was the horrible thing that happened that day? Okay, so what was the horrible thing? The horrible thing was that the baby uh, that was supposed to be uh, Sunil was put in the wrong basket, the wrong, right next to the wrong mother. And what would, have, uh, what would have happened? Where was the missing child found? The child was found sleeping next to a fisherwoman. So that's the answer to number three. Number four, if Nana Kaka had not noticed the hole in the ear, where would Sunil be living? He'd probably be living in a fishing village somewhere on the west coast of India. Next question. Find the words in the passage which means the same as. Now this is working on your vocabulary. Okay. There's uh, looking at things with great attention and noticing small details. So when we first started the, the passage there, we saw that the uncle was looking eagle-eyed at the baby. He was checking this baby out with the eye of an eagle. And as we all know, an eagle can see miles away. It can see a little mouse uh, way down on the ground and go down and swoop it up. So eagle-eyed. Number B. Okay, B is unaware of what's happening. You're just unaware of what's going on around you. And the word from the passage is oblivious. 
O-B-L-I-V-I-O-U-S, oblivious. You're just not there. Your mind is somewhere else. You're oblivious, unaware of what's happening. C, unknown or nor will be known, okay? And that's obscure. When something's obscure, you can't see it. You can't see through a uh, frosted window. You can't see the, uh, what's on the other side. That's why they use frosted windows in bathrooms. So you can't see what's there. It's obscure. You can see an image maybe of a person, so shadow or something, but you can't see the details. And a short period, a spell. A spell is a, a short period. So let's go on to the second level of questions. How did Sunil begin playing cricket? Who developed the, uh, who helped him develop the talent as a cricketer? Let's read on and we'll find the answers to these questions. My most vivid recollection of my childhood cricket playing days is the time I almost broke my mother's nose. She used to bowl me in a small gallery of our home where we played our daily match. In other words, the mother was playing cricket with this young boy every day with a tennis ball. Since the area was small, she would kneel to bowl or rather lob the ball to me. I hit one straight back at, at her and caught her bang on the nose, which started bleeding. Although it was a tennis ball, the distance between the two of them was very short, which accounts for the force which, with, which, which the ball hit her. He's a young boy. He was frightened. His mother's bleeding. I was frightened, but she shrugged it off. She was cool. Uh, she didn't react at all. She didn't want her son to feel that he had done anything bad. He was just learning how to be a good cricket player. She washed off her face, washed off all the blood, and the bleeding stopped. And we continued the game. But he restrained himself from doing any attacking shots. He was just playing a little defense at that point. Cricket, to use the cliche, is in my blood. He's telling more about how he feels about cricket. My father was a good club cricketer in his days and, and was a keen student of the game. Even now, his father's still alive, we have interesting discussions on various aspects of the game. And I have found his advice invaluable in the development of my career. So isn't this interesting? Sunil got to be a good cricket player because of his mother and his father, and maybe even some other people. It was a joint effort. And he keeps talking to his father now in interesting conversations. And as I have already said, I had the privilege of having a cricketing mother who helped me take the first steps in the game I came to love. My uncle, Mahadev Mantri, who played for India in four official tests, though not very successfully, was a force to reckon with in first-class games. Whenever I went to my uncle's house, my favorite pastime was to take out his pullovers, the pullovers they had when they played cricket. So he would pull them out and caress them with a sense of longing. And he's thinking, oh, these things are so colorful. They're so beautiful. So as a young boy, he was kind of programmed. I want to get one of these, uh, one of these pullovers, okay? So I was so attracted to the pullovers, I even dared to ask my uncle, could I have one, since he had so many of them. What did the uncle say? My uncle told me, hey, you have to sweat it out and earn the Indian colors, okay? You have to work hard to earn that distinction. That was a lesson I have never forgotten. I am glad my uncle did not succumb to my childish fancy and instead taught me there was no shortcut to the top. I was also fascinated by the many souvenirs he had and the large number of trophies he had won. What I liked the most was the stump bearing the autographs of the 1952 India 
uh, in, and English teams. I love to linger over their autographs of every player. Now, he's born in 49, and he's, uh, India uh, did very well in 1952. And he loved to look over these, uh, these autographs. Right from the beginning, I wanted to be a batsman. He wanted to be the hero, okay, to score many centuries and help India to be a worldwide powerhouse in the game of cricket. Right from the beginning, I wanted to be a batsman, and I hated to lose my wicket. It became such an obsession with me that if the rest of the boys ever got me out, I would fight and eventually walk home with the bat and ball. You can see they're playing here, but if he got put out, he would take the ball and bat and just leave. This would bring the game to an abrupt halt since nobody else had a ball or a bat. And the boys would curse me and call me names, but the tension did not long, last long as we generally got along very well. Among these early, uh, those early comrades whom I played with, oh, before that, the boys cursed me, the tension did not last long. We often played matches against, against uh, teams made up by other people around the area. And um, the uh, boys made of neighboring bu uh, buildings. And there was a tremendous interest in the trophies, as we call them. These trophies were small white metal cups, which we all contributed and bought for as little as one rupee 50 paisa. These little uh, white trophies, they would buy and they would give out to the team that won. So now that we've uh, read these uh, few paragraphs, we have a few questions. How did Gavas Gavaskar break his mother's nose is the first question. So you remember his mother was bowling to him in a small place a small little galley. And uh, he was a good, a good batsman already, and he hit the ball very hard, and even though it was a tennis ball, it hit her in the nose, okay? And um, it, uh, it, it broke the nose a little bit, and she bled quite a bit. Two, what are the qualities of his mother's character that were brought up from this part of the story? Pick the two words, phrases, that best describe her from the ones given below. So, we have a number of words, okay, here, and uh, we'll pick out the ones that we think would, uh, the two best words, okay? Let's go through all the words. Cooperate, helpful, unwilling to cooperate, clever, cricketer, excellent cricketer, encouraging and patient. So we know that that wasn't very helpful to get a broken nose. We know she was unwilling to cooperate. She's not that. She's, um, she's a little clever, but we don't know if she's an excellent cricketer. We do know that she was encouraging to her son, and we do know that she was patient. She didn't mind the fact that she had to keep bowling even though she had hurt her nose. So the proper answer are patient and encouraging. Next question, when Gavaskar says, cricket was in my blood, what does he mean? Tick the correct choice. One, he struggles and gives blood to play cricket. Two, his family has taught him the game. Three, he has inherited an interest in the game from his family members. And four, it is a dangerous game. Well, number two and three are very close, but number three is more correct, and that's the right answer. He's inherited an interest from his family members. Both his uncles, his father, and his mother, they love the game of cricket. So that's the correct answer. Number three. What did Gavaskar like to do whenever he went to his uncle's house? Okay? Do you remember? When he went to his uncle's house, he would look at all the pullovers see all the nice colors. 
And he would take out the stump that was signed by the 1952 uh, cricket team. Number five, what lesson did his uncle teach him? Do you remember the lesson? Here he asked for the pullovers, but his uncle said, no way. I earned these. I had to work hard. You have to earn them too. To earn your colors, you have to work hard. Number six, there is no shortcut to the top means which one is correct. You can have a high position in life through shortcuts. <laughs> Not very good. Two, you must work hard to succeed in life. Mm, that looks pretty good. Let's see about three. You can reach the top of the mountain by taking short steps. Not true. Four, to succeed in life, you must take big jumps. Mm, not bad, but number two, you must work hard in life to succeed is the correct answer. Seven, which souvenir did Gavaskar like the most and why? When he went to his uncle's house, he loved to see the stump with all the signatures on it because these were famous cricket players and he could see their signature and he saw all the signatures were different and he thought about these, these uh, beautiful cricket players and he wanted to become one. Number eight, Gavaskar said, I hated losing my wicket. He did not want to be out, okay? So what would happen every time he got out? And you know what would happen. He'd take the bat and ball and he would leave. He would just go. He didn't want to play anymore. How would the other boys react to this? They would shout and yell because they wanted to keep playing the game. They would call him names. They would do all sorts of things. What does this behavior show about Gavaskar? Okay? He loved the game so much, if he couldn't win, he didn't want to play. He just wanted to win. And uh, if he wasn't winning, he was going to go somewhere else. Number nine, find the words from the passage, which means the same as clear. Okay? When we read this passage, we look and we see the word clear. In paragraph number three, the word is called vivid. He could vividly see what was going on. These colors were vivid. It means like when you see a bright sunset or a bright sun, uh, sunrise. The colors are so vivid. They're very vivid, very striking. So vivid means clear and crisp. Two, controlled and checked. What words from the passage mean control and checked? If you look at the passage, you'll see the word restrained. When you restrain something, you're controlling it. Three, of great value. Paragraph four, the word invaluable. We know the word valuable means very valued. Invaluable means beyond value. It's just a very expensive, very beautiful thing. Number four, an object kept as a reminder of an event. So you go to a big game, you want to get a ball, you want to get a bat, you want to get a stump, you want to get some reminder of the game, okay? And what do they call that? It's a souvenir. You go to any big game or any nice function, you want to have a souvenir. And a strong feeling, number five, a strong feeling, a desire, an idea. Wow, I've got this idea. I've got a strong feeling. I've got to be a cricket player. It's an obsession. And that's the answer to that next one is obsession. Then we go ahead to comprehensive questions. Comprehensive questions. Answer the following questions in 55 to 50 to 55 words. And this is your homework assignment, okay? I want you to answer these um, first, uh, four, first four questions, okay? I want you to answer this in a paragraph of 50 to 55 words. I'll give you a few hints. But I want you to answer these, put them in a paragraph, and send it to me, or do it yourself at home, okay? And we'll go through some, uh, uh, this will be an experience for you to write down reading comprehension. We looked at the facts, but now we have to know if the comprehension is there. And that's understanding what the story is all about. So the first question is, how did his uncle's keen observation help Gavaskar 
to retain his identity. That's the whole uh, first three paragraphs were written, how the uncle would go in, saw the baby, his brand new nephew, okay, and looked this baby over, saw the hole in the left eardrum, earlobe, and thought, oh, that's interesting. But the rest of the baby was in very good shape. He came back the next day, sees the baby, does not have the hole in the ear, and goes, this can't be the same baby. So he went around all the cribs and he found the real baby, he found Sunil, and found out that they'd been given baths and they were put in the wrong cribs. So that's the paragraph you have to write. You write it nicely and neatly in good handwriting and send it to me. Number two, how did Gavaskar's family members help him to become a good cricketer? We've gone over three incidents. We've gone over what his mother did, what his father did, and what his uncle did. The mother would bowl to him and encourage him to become a good batsman. The father gave him advice. He said, look, if you want to play cricket, you've got to do this, this, and this. In fact, he still advises him to this very day. And then the uncle told him to work hard and showed him many souvenirs uh, and gave him some encouraging talk on how to become a good cricket player. Number three, how did Gavaskar behave during the matches in his childhood days? And how did his friends handle him on these occasions? So, we know he's, he would be out, they would call him out, and so what he would do, he'd take his ball and bat and leave. And a mince name calling and everything. So finally the boys decided, before Sunil even started batting, that after a certain number of, of, of balls, uh, that he would be declared out. Uh, and so uh, then and they made him say before the match, okay, the majority gives the rule here. If we say you're out, you have to go along with it. So they got Sunil to admit that if the majority of people said he was out, you know, by, uh, by not getting to the place on time, that he was out. And he would go along with that. So that's how his friends handled him finally. Four, in his childhood days, Gavaskar was not a sporting player. He would walk away with the bat and ball whenever he was declared out, which brought the game to an abrupt end. How would you convince a friend of yours who behaves in a similar fashion? So this question gets you to look into your own personal life and ask you how you would relate to somebody else that was acting this way. You would say, look, this is not nice. You've got the only bat and ball, okay? And uh, we want to keep playing. So please, you know, we, uh, you have to use a number of different arguments. And then we have uh, 4B, okay? What are the qualities you require in order to be a good team player? Pick out five qualities from the box. So we show you a box here. There's nine qualities, all right? So let's go through them. We have the quality of cooperation. So if you want to be a good team player, you have to cooperate. So this is one, without a doubt. This is one of the right ones. Now what about over competitiveness? You're really, you're, you're trying to beat everybody else. You're over competitive. You don't want other people to bat. You want to grab all the balls. Not a good quality. I don't think that's one of the answers. Next one is egotistical behavior. Wow, I just hit a sixer, or I just hit a four point, you know? I'm playing much better than you guys. Is that good team spirit? Not very good team spirit. Let's go here to collaboration. Collaboration is you get together with these, uh, with these uh, players, and you say, look, this team guy, he always hits it over here. Let's put more of our defense over here so we can catch the ball. You collaborate, you get together. It's a very good idea if you're gonna be on a team. Overambition. Ah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to cheat, I'm going to lie, I'm going to steal, I'm going to do anything I can to win the game. No, no, no. We have to play fair and square. The best thing about playing cricket is you want to be cricket. You want to be honest. You want to develop comradeship. And you want everybody to have a good time. So that's not a correct answer. Individualistic approach. No, I'm not going to do the thing you guys are doing. I'm going to do it my way. You know, I'm going to wear different colors. I'm going to uh, use a different bat that uh, you guys can't use, you know? 
being individualistic and not going along with the rest of the team. Not a good quality. Consideration. Consideration. If somebody likes your bat, you let them use your bat, okay? Consideration. Uh, anything you can do to help a team member, uh, this is a very good quality to have if you're on a team. Taking responsibility. Okay, you dropped the ball. Okay, you can't say it was somebody else's fault that I dropped the ball. You dropped the ball. You take the responsibility. And then everybody appreciates it. You'll do better the next time. So we have one, two, three, four. They want five. Acceptance. Whatever happens, we accept. The other team wins. Okay, next time we'll beat them. We have five beautiful qualities that we've learned from this uh, uh, autobiography of how to get along in cricket. So you have your homework assignment to write the, the answers to the first four, uh, first four questions. And uh, I will see you in the next class and we'll go into vocabulary enrichment and we'll take care of all the other issues. Home Siren.